Can everyone hear me okay out there? Am I live? Yes? Okay, wonderful. Uh, well, first things first, thanks for coming back from lunch. I know, probably not an easy decision. Um, so, uh, thanks for being here. I'm Michael Simonson. I'm a software engineer that works at Cisco. Uh, I work um, on the uh, extended detection and response, or XDR, team uh, as the tech lead for our threat intelligence team. So, today I'm going to be talking at sort of an introductory level about um, threat intelligence platform, how to architect one, and cybersecurity just in general. I'm hoping by the end um, that I can have all of you thinking a little bit more like a cybersecurity professional. So um, let's get straight into things. Uh, yeah, rule number one of being a cybersecurity professional is you remind people to stop clicking links in text messages and emails at every chance that you get. Uh, the IRS will not text you. Amazon might text you, but be careful. Um, and so, yeah, stop clicking on links. Thank you very much. All right, so that's it. Yep, thanks. Uh, thank you. Yeah, no. <laughs> no, there is a bit more to it. Unfortunately, it's a bit more complicated than that. Um, so first things first, why do we want to care about um, cybersecurity at all as closurists or developers? Um, we could spend our time solving any number of problems. Uh, Three-pointed answer, the first of which is that I really believe that the internet and all the systems and services that extend from it offer our best chance at an equitable global society. And so in order to make that happen, we all get benefits along the way. Uh, in cybersecurity, we call those benefits the CIA triad, which is in the middle of the screen. It stands for confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Those are the goals that we pursue when we are attempting to defend networks. And then the final point that I want to make, um, which it, it sounds like we're going to have a, a debate about determinism uh, at the end of today. <laughs> but uh, in the field of cybersecurity, the problem set is reasonably well defined, right? So the bad guys are lying, cheating, stealing. Uh, it, it's very difficult to invent a new lying, cheating, or stealing. Um, it's easy to change a malicious IP address from one address to the other. Uh, but it's very difficult to invent a new behavior. And so since we can capture those behaviors, we can capture appropriate responses to those behaviors. And uh, I, I would argue that cybersecurity is, in short, sort of a solvable problem. And that's very motivating for me. Um, so yeah, so the end goal here is admirable. Steps to get there help everyone. Um, and there's a real capability to, to pursue it. So, so that's why. Uh, so there. <laughs> Um, all right, so let's talk about um, uh, threat intelligence architecture generally and a platform to, uh, to use it. Um, four, four components here, really, and it's not that dissimilar from any uh, sort of three-tiered architecture that you might see out in the world or build yourself. Um, in short, we aim to answer the questions that are at the bottom of the screen. So I'm going to talk about the, the left three here and sort of challenge you to start thinking about the fourth one. So. The questions that we, I think the text is big enough, but the questions we aim to answer is, uh, what data exists in my environment that is worth analyzing or worth conducting intelligence on? How can I model that intelligence and then store it? And then how can I make it distributable and usable for other people? So um, yeah, and then uh, sort of final point, we'll talk about what kind of questions you can answer from the intelligence and the availability of it. Um, all right, so I don't want to make this a, a, a sales pitch, but I'd be remiss not to mention that uh, those middle two components are uh, open source tools that are uh, built by Cisco right now, and uh, tons of other companies have their own variants of these things. Um, we call our model the Cisco Threat Intelligence Model. Basically, like I said, that's a structure and a system for communicating about threat intelligence, which I'll talk more about in just a second. So that's available at uh, github threatcrit.com slash ctim. And then we also have a open source, generally available um, threat intelligence API. Uh, these are both two pretty good tools to sort of get you started on, on thinking and playing around in GitHub with uh, some of this code. Um, so, okay, so the first question, what data exists in my environment that's worth analyzing? Uh, what is threat intelligence is, is this question. So in short, it's the collection, processing, and analysis of uh, data from an operational environment. So that could be information about the internal systems that you're trying to defend. It could be data from external sources, which we'll talk about in just a second. It can even be just non-digital systems altogether. So uh, the effects of certain groups out in the world and what's happening to them and what they want to happen to other people. 
Um, so what this means is, you know, th this funnel is not to scale. You need an enormous amount of data to collect, to procure any information, to do any analysis, to gr gather any intelligence. Um, and so where do you start? Well, uh, here's where you start. Uh, two sources largely for threat intelligence that provide uh, sort of an opening to the funnel. The first is information about your internal systems. So that might come from red teams or blue teams that are conducting behaviors on your network to give you more information about uh, potential vulnerabilities or um, just system infrastructure generally. Uh, another source of intelligence, uh, really more information, is tons of external sources that are all, many of which are open source and generally available. Um, so Cisco Talos is on that list, but so are some of our competitors. Uh, folks like MITRE, uh, folks like the National Vulnerability Database, there's tons of threat intelligence available to you in the world um, just as a, a normal closure developer. So I encourage you to go check out uh, any number of these sources. Um, okay, so let's start to talk about a little bit about the modeling. So uh, MITRE is, is an external source on here. The difference between information is MITRE will describe, for example, an ongoing threat campaign that targets maybe manufacturing companies in the U.S via phishing emails. That sentence is information about a potential threat. Have they targeted me or could they target me? That is threat intelligence. That's a level of analysis on just information that can sort of guide your decision making. Um, okay, so let's talk really in detail about uh, actually modeling and storing. So uh, this is an XKCD comic that's sort of a classic uh, in the threat intelligence uh, uh, space. At any time, there's between 10 and like a thousand, I, I'm not kidding, like a thousand um, uh, cyber threat intelligence uh, structures or models. Um, so, and, and, and it's always growing. The reality is this joke comic is uh, actually the best advice I can give you when it comes to architecting your threat intelligence model. So um, some of these sources like Styx or even CTIM uh, are, are great places to start. But when you're architecting a platform, you're going to need the flexibility to change that model to sort of suit whatever commercial or non-commercial interests that you have. Um, consumers of your model, stakeholders of your model are gonna demand uh, things of you that will require you to control pieces and parts of your model and how it interacts with their model. Um, and so there are tons of reasons to just build your own standard, even though that sounds very counterintuitive. Um, I'm seven minutes in already, so there's no way I'm gonna talk about this, uh, but some data engineering principles to consider when architecting threat intelligence. Um, okay, so uh, kind of onto the third point here, which is how can you make threat intelligence generally accessible? So I said at the beginning, there's nothing really ground-breaking about cybersecurity and the data that we work with to have a, have a sort of positive outcome, but there are a few things uh, when you're building a threat intelligence REST API, like CTIA is, um, that are really good things to keep in mind. Uh, first and foremost, you want to ensure that your uh, access layer, your API layer, offers some resemblance to the intelligence that operates behind it or that sort of backs it. The further these two things disconnect, the more room there is for just endless jargon and misconceptions about threat intelligence, which really undermines the purpose of it. Um, and then points two and three here are, are also very straightforward. So the questions that consumers will ask of your API need to be answered quickly, usually, uh, but more, well, maybe as importantly, depending on who you ask. Um, the question that is asked of an API layer about threat intelligence is often much uh, deeper than it appears at first glance. So let me give an example of that. A, a typical question of a, a threat intelligence API is a reputation lookup. So is this IP address malicious? Is this file hash malicious? The answer is often yes, but if your API layer just says yes, it is, uh, they're gonna hit you four more times because they need the answers uh, like who said it's malicious, um, when did they say it was malicious, for how long did they say it's malicious? I can change a URL uh, at machine speed. Um, I cannot change the behavior that a URL is doing at machine speed. So going back to that sort of can't invent a new lying, cheating, or stealing. Um, and so uh, they all, they'll also want to know questions like, does anyone agree with your disposition of that uh, given observable? And so those are some questions to start to think about when you, talk, when you think about uh, architecting this sort of API layer or building it in. Um, okay, so I talked a little bit about these kind of throughout the last 10 minutes or so, which is 
Um, I'll just call out a couple of extra things here. So on the left-hand side, the things you should really try to do in this API layer is spend the effort to make your model interrupt with other models. I know that sounds sort of counterintuitive because why would you build your own model in the first place? Uh, the reality is all of those little extensions are sort of new added value that you bring to the table, but you can't throw away all of the existing value just to get those little pieces. Um, that, that sort of undermines threat intelligence as well. Um, and then I'll only mention one of these don'ts, which was mentioned uh, earlier today, I think, by the, by the AI folks. Uh, don't try and do your consumer's job for them. So don't try and anticipate what context or what use case of threat intelligence uh, a person accessing your model is trying to do. Um, let them do that so that you don't uh, sort of color or misinterpret that request or the intelligence with your own kind of bias. Um, and so those are sort of the pro tips there. Okay, uh, so yeah, we're about 10 minutes in already, so that's kind of all the time that I have. I'll leave you as an exercise uh, with the following kind of three questions. This is the point of threat intelligence and architecting a threat intelligence model. I remind my team and people within Cisco all the time, um, not that we're particularly bad, but uh, threat intelligence people are particularly bad. It's not an academic pursuit. Uh, it might be free, you might make it open source, you might do this work pro bono, you might uh, do this for um, the capitalist gods uh, and, and try and make money off doing this. The purpose of threat intelligence is to be used. And so just creating more of it doesn't actually help anyone. And so always keep that in mind. With that in mind, the types of questions you want to sort of deliver answers to, and, and again, exercise for the reader, are things like what groups have targeted my network? You might ask internal facing questions, like who in my org is the highest value threat vector? Uh, and then there's always the important question at the end of the day, which is what can I do if I'm compromised? How did they get in? Why did they get in? Um, and so on. So um, that's definitely over my time already, so I'll leave it at that. Uh, I'm very happy to take any questions um, in the hallway. I'll probably be drinking coffee and chatting with folks for the rest of the afternoon. Um, like I said, my name is Michael Simonson. I work for, um, I work for Cisco on the XDR team. Uh, tons of people contribute to this work. Uh, the people that I've listed here on the screen are just folks who have kind of personally influenced my career. And uh, yeah, that's it. So thanks for coming.